and and happy happy to have people back from lunch. I wish I would have had lunch in Bologna as well. Um, here in Helsinki, it's freezing cold, and uh, I would change places if that were possible at that time. But right now, let's go on with the remote participation, at least for the part of the people and part of the people we have physically there in Bologna. So uh, my name is Ilkka Lakaniemi. I actually wear three hats. So one of the hats is with the Aalto University, and you see the logo in the background of my, my screen, uh, where I lead a research unit on innovation and, um, and, and platform economy at the Aalto University School of Business. But at the same time, I act as a chief economist and advisor to several Finnish companies and as an investor in startups, including AI and data analytics. So what I have heard today before in the presentations, plus the questions that were being asked about the platform are extremely relevant. And I think the discussion so far has been pointing out the right, right questions and the right topics. Because we are at the stage where it, earlier on we had a message that it's good time to be a European entrepreneur. And I think right now it is a good time to have those type of tools and things that are truly needed by the companies. So to be very pragmatic, moving from the hype around AI to the actual reality on AI and advanced data analytics, what it is that you can really do with the tools that we have at hand. And from the investor in me, it actually says that when I talk to the companies, be their startups or scale-ups, they're not specifically looking for software tools. They're looking for people to talk to. They're looking for expertise. They're looking for use cases and shared insights and key learnings. What it is that other people have been doing, what type of tools do they recommend? And it doesn't exclude using European tools or American tools or Asian tools, but you have to do it in a way that it truly has a business case for the company. It helps the company to grow. It helps the company to find the right type of uh, needs for the technologies where it makes the most sense. But at the same time, what I'm especially pleased is that with the AI for EU, we have created a platform that adheres also to the European values. Because earlier on, we had a discussion on the fact that uh, you, you have to develop tools that are easy for the industry to use. And now talking about large enterprises all the way down to the small startup. But at the same time, we are moving through regulatory trends and to trends within the industry towards understanding that not only we're looking for value from the technologies, but we're looking for trust. And we're looking for the type of trusted tools that can give the companies both. So you can have to have the business value proposition there, but at the same time, they have to trust that those tools will work, obviously. They need to be robust, they need to be mature enough, but at the same time, they need to carry the European values that we value, which is the openness. Openness is one part of the, the, the key of the platform that I value very highly myself. And also, furthermore, it is the type of cases that we have developed, like what you will be now hearing in this session, uh, the cases from the pilots and the cases from the open call success stories that actually open up for a larger audience that what it is that you can do with the platform. You can do many things. I have, for instance, uh, in, in my uh, environment here in Finland, I have guided people to look into the AI for EU platform and what it can offer for them. And they have been surprised pleasantly that there is so much expertise and so much different information and knowledge already gathered in one place. Because previously they were going all around the place and looking for the type of information that you can now get from uh, the platform. So I'm more than happy now to open up the session uh, after the, uh, I hope, a very uh, good lunch there in Bologna uh, to go through the pilots and and on also the open call success stories. And, and then towards the end, time allowing, we'll, we'll be uh, looking for an interactive questions and answer session. So please uh, <clears throat> keep your mind sharp and uh, ask any difficult questions from us uh, around the platform as well. 
But uh, now I will give the floor to the first speaker. And Roberta, I'm not extremely clear about what is the order, but I, I think you have given the order to people. So what I have here first on my list is actually uh, Peter Schuller uh, on AI for industry from Vienna. Yes, and uh, I hope you can see my slides and I hope you can hear me. If you can hear me, please let me know because I cannot see the chat anymore. We can hear you better. People are nodding their yeah. heads in the podium, so Thank I you. think you're okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I will talk about the AI for industry. This is a pilot, it is a collaboration between three partners in the AI for You project, Siemens from Germany. They work on a skill matching uh, algorithm with based on an owl reasoner, web ontology language reasoner. And also see on the right of the slide, you can see the prototype or the experimental plant of one subcompany of Siemens that is actually the physical reality of this pilot. And uh, the second part then is uh, Pilot is Theo Wien from Austria. We work on production planning based on answer set programming. So the first two partners work on symbolic reasoning, symbolic artificial intelligence, and the third partner is Fraunhofer IIS from Germany. They work on time estimation based on a neural network. So this is a pilot that brings together all these technologies and there were a few challenges on the way. First of all, to make the components usable by the other partners. How we did this? In the AI for your experiments platform, there will be a, a session tomorrow about this. Uh, everything is a Docker container, everything that runs, and so we packaged our, our components as Docker containers. This eliminated all the setup cost, the setup issues, and uh, but this is not enough. Then we had to combine all these components into one working solution. For that, we defined two protobuf interfaces between the components, and then we used the AI for your experiments platform to automatically orchestrate this. And the final challenge was to protect intellectual property because uh, one of the partners, Siemens, uh, cannot uh, publish even in binary form their assets for internal reasons. But this is fine. We created a dummy replacement with the same interface, which can now be used by everyone from the platform. And Siemens just needs to change the, the URI of the Docker container, and they can use their own internal component instead. Um, this is AI for industry in the AI for experiments platform. We have a user interface. I will show it in the next slide in the demo. And with this user interface, we create, we configure what we want to produce in the factory. The factory puts uh, caps on cans. So they're prototypical products where uh, we put a, can, a cap on a can of different color. And this will you get configurable products. The skill matcher first decides which machine can do which job in the factory. This is passed on to the planner. The planner tries to find a way, a series of actions, a sequence of actions to produce the desired output given the input and the desired output. And finally, the time estimation module estimates the quality of the plan or more the time, the time which product takes how much time in the system. This is based on a neural network, as I said before. Just as one example, the protobuf interface for planning, we have two message types. What is the desired magazine state? It's a repetition of outputs, where output is red, white, or blue. That's the color of the cap of the product. And the planner request gives an ontology that pro provides the factory layout. and uh, a sequence of desired magazine states, sorry, this defines for each magazine out what is the output in that out magazine and how many time steps we use for planning. And now is the demo time. Now I will show the video. I hope you can now see the video. The, uh, this is the user interface, it's a web interface. Now for your experiments, you can have web interfaces as user interfaces mainly and here. We configured the desired output. 
the number of steps we submit it to the pipeline and then we get the planning result on the top right you can see a visualization of the factory that's where i showed the photo before the work pieces go in sorry the work pieces go in at the supplier move in a circular conveyor belt because sometimes it's necessary that the piece has to go an extra round because the magazines for the caps have different colors so if you want to have a a blue, a red, and a red cap, you need to configure them in a certain order to get them in the right order into the magazine. So some pieces can go around. In the bottom, you see the planning result, the result of the planner, and below the result of the time estimator. And um, I can now also show this takes seven steps, this plan. And if I change, the desired output on top. I want another piece of output. I can submit it again to the pipeline. It is computed and we can take again seven steps, but this time we can process three products because it's parallelized the production. Uh, and I think this already concludes my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so uh, let's take the questions towards the end of the session since we're a little bit pressed with time, if that's okay. And then we'll move on to the next one. So we have Thomas Pariente Lobo from Atos on the agricultural case. Please, Thomas. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, let me share my screen one second. I hope you can see it now. Okay, so yes, this is a, a different pilot, uh, the AI for Agriculture pilot uh, that we did in collaboration with several institutions, as you will see uh, in a couple of slides. Uh, so this is a, a slightly different uh, pilot than, than the previous one, because in, uh, in our case, we use mostly uh, remote sensing, but also some uh, close-up uh, images from fungers, as you will see, to predict some uh, some specific aspects in the in the specific specifically in the in the agricultural pilot. So the idea is that uh, we did some batch processing uh, mechanisms rather than than going into into actual real-time predictions. So let me start by uh, by showing you uh, the more or less the what, what is the the pilot in a nutshell. So as you can, as you know, uh, in precision agriculture or smart farming, as uh, is also known, uh, this type of technology aims at uh, analyzing data to predict and improve and optimize the, the production in, and in general the quality of the of different farming aspects and uh, of course also helping to try to help in the reducing the environmental footprint and the impact in the, in soil and many other aspects. Now. So in the scope of this uh, particular application that we did in uh, AI for you, uh, this pilot is uh, trying to to help on a, a very concrete uh, aspect, which is uh, trying to improve the quality of uh, of the of the product of the wine production, and especially the the grapes uh, during the during the harvesting time. The harvesting time. So this pilot is the, um, is basically predicting yield and assessing quality of the production of uh, different vineyards. So the idea is that with these uh, technologies, uh, we are trying to showcase uh, a typical scenario in a, in a um, precision farming uh, 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 pilot. So uh, let me show you who we are in this pilot. Uh, first of all, uh, we didn't have any end user at the beginning because um, basically uh, the end users here are the um, the actual bingers. So uh, we contacted uh, three uh, three specific bingers outside of the project uh, in the Ribera del Duero wine region in Spain, which is a um, registered denomination of origin. And uh, uh, these three bingers, Prado Ray, Vizcarra, and Martin Verdugo, agreed to participate in in this uh, in this pilot. And uh, and then they allowed partners to, of course, to take uh, images, take pictures. Uh, in the in their different land parcels and particular ones that we, we agree with them uh, with some mobile applications and, and drones uh, during the 20, 2020 and 2021 summer seasons so they uh, uh, we also went to the extra mile to to even uh, being able to harvest uh, the grapes in these particular land parcels in order to validate the, the afterwards the results of the of the models 
and the predictions. So this has made, uh, has made possible not only to develop a specific AI models, but also the, gather, uh, the gathering of data and labeling of uh, specific uh, pictures, which is also a, a good resource from the, from the pilot's perspective. Uh, so uh, in, in principle, this is very interesting because it also shows the participation of uh, other stakeholders in the, in the community. Uh, regarding the, the, the partners that were involved in this pilot, besides uh, Atos, who is the task leader, uh, and we participated especially in the, in the quality prediction model, uh, we have uh, an SME, uh, a smart rural, an SME that is based uh, in this wine region, in the rural region in Spain, and they are experts in uh, intelligent solution for farmers, and in particular for, for vineyards and uh, they provided also expertise on data collection from drones and, and mobile. So they were quite involved with the end users. We also have uh, uh, DLR, DLR, which is the partner uh, leading the access to remote sensing algorithms, uh, in particular from satellites. Uh, UPC, the Polytechnic of Catalonia, that provided expertise on developing uh, computer vision models for fruit counting. Uh, last but not least, the University of Athens that uh, also were uh, helping on uh, modeling the, the data storage, uh, data fusion and interlinking using some specific tools that they have uh, and at the end of the day providing uh, access to a knowledge graph uh, containing the data acquired during the, pro during the, the work on the, on the pilot. So uh, in, in particular, this pilot uh, uh, there, as you can see, provided different uh, different results to the platform. Uh, in particular, the, uh, besides uh, some specific models, we also provided, as I mentioned, uh, uh, a labeled data sets uh, for for images uh, uh, from taken from uh, from with mobile pack pictures, but also from drones. So the, the, those uh, data sets are also available in the platform. So let me go to the next slide where we show very quickly a, a kind of uh, functional architecture of, uh, of the pilot. On the left hand side, you can see uh, you can see the data collection process. Uh, this data collection, as I mentioned, was uh, carried out uh, using mobiles and drones. Uh, we, the, the, our partners, Marula, developed a, a specific mobile application to get the data and also label the data as they were uh, get, getting the images with uh, the information got uh, directly on the field. And, uh, and yeah, the, this, uh, uh, the, at the end of the day, what we did is uh, to, to uh, include um, also information from satellites and also from other, uh, other data sources uh, coming from, uh, from the specific uh, binders, because they provided us with uh, laboratory data, uh, soils analysis and other, other stuff that were, so, were also included into a knowledge graph. And with all this information, plus the the analysis of uh, with computer vision models of the of uh, of the images provided by uh, by the data collection, we at the end of the day uh, populated this no this knowledge graph and created these uh, uh, prediction models for quality and yield prediction. And uh, the result of that is also stored in the knowledge graph and can be visualized afterwards using some specific techniques, uh, uh, for instance, from the, the University of Athens, in order to uh, to, to showcase uh, what some of the of their tools, and uh, and also from uh, uh, the the own the um, dashboard that uh, Smart Rural is uh, designing for for their for their own customers. So here you can see a couple of screenshots of uh, of the Smart Rural uh, user interface. Uh, taking data directly from from our knowledge graph. So as a conclusion, uh, of course, we used um, uh, all uh, the most of the facilities provided by the a a for you platform, uh, the experimentation facilities to to create and develop the models. We dockerize all of our models, uh, use uh, all the protobuf and other stuff interfaces that uh, that uh, that were created by by a for you. And uh, the idea, the goal was not to create a really a fully fledged application really to be used in the real world, but basically to showcase the results of, uh, of this in a collaborative project within, within different, uh, di different stakeholders in order to reach a goal that of creating an, an application that could be also showcases to, to the end users. So from a technical perspective, we found quite interesting also the way of uh, uh, using uh, uh, this, uh, all, all these artifacts uh, deployed in Kubernetes environment, 
it, it was quite easy to, to be honest at the beginning as of course it's complicated but then you get used to that and it's uh, quite easy to uh, to get used to this uh, this type of applications and uh, and also the models were the were finally deployed in the in the smart rural web uh, web um, uh, web server so uh, everything was de deployed in our in our pilot site and and everything worked perfectly so uh, in reality uh, we believe that this is a a good approach, especially if you when you want to do some collaborative project, then it need uh, that need also some uh, specific um, uh, procedures to to uh, to agree between the different participants, but also to reuse some of the existing content. Uh, during the project, we didn't have time the time the, to reuse because the the, the the catalog was not so populated. But we hope that this approach could be very useful in, in the future. So basically, I think that's it. Uh, I could show also some um, other life as a life um, visualization that you like, but in terms of time, I think that uh, that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you very much. And next one is Kerstin Bach. Kerstin, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Ika. Um, yes, and uh, thanks, Thomas, for the nice introduction. And as we know, it's uh, important to have uh, Good wine for a good life. Uh, so we believe it's uh, the same to have some um, clean air to have a healthy life as well. So uh, I'll be talking about our pilot, which uh, is going to be the, or which name is the air quality pilot that we have run in the city of Trondheim. Uh, my name is uh, Kirsten Bach. I work at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. And this pilot was a collaboration between Telenor and TNU as well as uh, ITI CERT. Um, and I'll be talking about first the challenges uh, of our of our work set out in the very beginning. Um, so first of all, air quality is a very hyper local phenomenon. So we really have uh, changes from streets to streets, from small areas to, to from, from one to another. And uh, today, often um, air quality is measured by a few number of high-end sensors, which are very costly. And um, But what we know also from a recent report that has been published by the European Environment Agency is that um, there is uh, air quality is, is quite a, a problem. I just have to check. Uh, is there something wrong? Because I can hear that people are... It seems that some people are unable to see the slides for some reason, but for I, I would assume the majority it works. So please. Okay. Continue. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. Um, yes. So uh, yeah. So there's uh, more than 300 in 2019. More than 300,000 premature deaths were attributed to to uh, chronic exposure to fine particular matter. So um, having a Better air quality, especially in the in the cities, is a is a really crucial thing to do. Uh, and the idea behind our pilot was instead of having the high end and expensive uh, sensors, to use a number of low cost sensors and uh, use those to build a scalable network. Um, we also explored the use of uh, of mobile um, units such as uh, city buses or or city cars. Uh, as well as uh, we also, even though we knew that the local sensors will have a, a lower quality, but the idea is to use uh, um, machine learning techniques to to improve uh, that uh, to have a good uh, yeah uh, representation of what type of um, um, uh, be, be able to use this to predict the air quality. And as, what you can see down here is how the air quality. Uh, can look like, for example, in the city of Trondheim. So this was earlier this year, in the end of October, early November, and you can see here that usually you uh, build the average uh, per per day and then uh, look into how the, the overall air quality was. And what we would like to see is to have a, a prediction when we reach these, um, these uh, high ranges, which means this is the air pollution, so, or the, the high amount of uh, PM, which is uh, getting uh, 
which is a, a more dangerous. So we try to avoid these uh, these areas. So we want to have the the overall air quality measures low. And also, what we know is that uh, if we if we know these increases uh, a few hours or a day or two in advance, there are measures that, uh, for example, the municipality can do. So to um, address this uh, this issue, we had a number of objectives, uh, and the the core ones was to use to the use of AI um, uh, on air quality data uh, to to check whether we are able to build this network and do a data collection uh, in in a real world setting, uh, have a real world uh, visualization as well as. Uh, work on predictions and eventually decision support, for example, um, the environmental unit in, in the city. So we have been working with the with the municipality of Trondheim as well as with the small startup called um, Lab 5E that helped us to develop the, the sensor units as well as um, the uh, platform to col collect the data. Um, second, we also uh, investigated the combination of other data sources such as uh, traffic, um, oops, uh, yeah, sorry, such as traffic, fireplaces, and of course the weather forecast plays plays a huge role because these particle measures, especially these PM10 that I've shown, they would bind so that we are able to uh, so so once it rains, it really uh, cleans out uh, the air. Um, talking about what we or how we use the uh, AI for EU platform services. So as I mentioned, we have in the beginning the sensor network with a number of sensors. Then we have the an, an IoT gateway to collect the data and, a, and an uh, air quality server that provides us the data. And then we focused, uh, especially in the last uh, half of the project, to use the platform services to to do some basic data cleaning as well as the data calibration and the and the visualization of the data. So uh, we focus on the use case of uh, doing this remote data calibration. So to, to have um, one of our small sensors or the micro sensors placed next to an uh, industrial sensor, then learning the calibration and then ideally uh, deploying this into the, into the entire network. And also we explored a number of visualization tools. So we had uh, the, the we produced a dashboard as well as we had a, a study, um, no, a student group working on an app that was uh, more for the for the citizens to be able to uh, look in, into the air quality and also um, maybe using it to to do some smart uh, road planning or, or walk planning. Um, as Peter already showed, uh, we have implemented uh, this in the uh, um, in the um, in the platform. So this is a screenshot um, uh, from the platform's Visual Studio, so that we can link our our resources and uh, some of the characteristics that we explored and uh, and uh, also got uh, some help uh, to to implement was that we have. Uh, private credentials um, so that we can basically access the air quality server and get the data um, into the platform and then run the calibration models as we go. Um, another nice thing was that uh, since it is a, a module setup, we can update containers, for example, change the, the calibration model or change out the, uh, the visualization without stopping the entire cluster so that we have a, a hot deployment. So once things are ready, can be, they can be updated. And we also have um, a requirement um, yeah, so that the data up, uh, output can be updated regularly so that the um, visualization interfaces are able um, to, to get uh, up-to-date data, which is especially important uh, when, for example, the municipality needs to make a decision on whether to deploy um, vehicles to clean the streets uh, or similar. And uh, just to, to wrap up, together with the Telenor, we have been uh, working on a, on a little story that has been released today. Um, and I'll show a 30 second teaser and uh, invite you to to look up uh, the full story, um, which is behind the, uh, the link and the QR code. In our work, we have discovered that we can use machine learning to improve the data 
coming from these microsensors. Having reliable source of air quality data, we have the possibility to adjust the measurements taken to improve the air quality in the city of Trondheim. Thank you, and uh, I'm of course happy to answer any questions uh, towards the end of the session. Thank you, Kerstin. Very, very good, and thanks for the sharing the video. That, that was good. So now uh, we went through the pilots, and the next group uh, we have excellent presentations from the Open Call Success Stories. And the first one is Valeri Zapico. Please, Valeri. Perfect. Good afternoon. So um, yeah, we present you just uh, um, the. Um, solution we deploy for the AI for You challenge that we call uh, RP4PL, the Reliable Prediction for Pump Lifetime. Um, so, uh, just a few words about Valkuren, um, which is a um, Belgium based company you know, specialized in big data solutions development with BI data analytics and AI services in order to help companies to leverage their business performance, uh, um, take better decisions and uh, optimize processes. So this is our team uh, composed with data engineers, scientists, data analysts, uh, full stack web developer and a support team. Um, for this challenge, so um, we help finally FIFA. Um, so FIFA produces pump which are high precision rotating objects uh, use in the semiconductor production and uh, the pump can be subject to early seizure due to manufacturing quality issues or mechanical problem. So uh, these failures lead to obvious uh, loss in production time and cost for the end users of the pump. So the objective is to help them to uh, detect early failures um, in advance and improve the quality of production. Um, so to respond to this challenge, we provide um, reliable and trustworthy predictions for early pump failure and the expected lifetime of the pump using uh, statistically valid techniques. And uh, this allows the information on the running time for all the pump, uh, not only the ones expected to fail early. Um, and our solution incorporates uh, uh, explainable AI techniques to provide a fully understandable and interpretable report associated with uh, each prediction. And um, um, our solution identifies also the reason and the causes um, for early failures enabling the improvement of the pump uh, production process. Um, uh, this is quite the flow we put in production through the web apps. I have the possibility to uh, load finally the files and uh, get some dashboards behind. So uh, we propose a, a global implementation for the, during the last six months and we optimize our process. So this is just uh, uh, I tell you on the, on the, the global planning, I would say. Um, it's based on our decision making process, so it's based on machine learning methods uh, for classifying and uh, classification and regression. Um, so it's important also to understand that the current pump failures prediction technique can uh, sorry, provide simple point prediction with no associated relatability. So our solution on the other hand uses a conformal prediction to provide uh, such a confidence level um, to be in line with uh, guidelines for reliable and trustworthy uh, AI. So we use a state-of-the-art techniques to developed uh, in the last two years to help FIFA uh, make informed decisions uh, related to early pump uh, failures. So this is a view of um, the, the, uh, the first version of the web app uh, we developed for them. Um, so they have the possibility to upload the file and get and get a directly a return with the, with the dashboard and, and a detailed uh, view on the predictions. So um, you can see that it's a yeah quite a, an, inter, an intuitive and interactive tool for FIFA, so uh, which incorporates the results of the predictive models. Um, and it plays the risk of failures. Um, 
and expected that you have to value that within a confidence uh, interval. Um, and the final product also includes uh, a tool to explain the result of our uh, machine learning model as a combination of these approaches help FIFO uh, to fully understand the behavior of the developed predictive model. So uh, we have integration of uh, visualization tools for the root causes, FIVO is able to extract uh, the correct information to improve uh, the production process. So finally, the benefits for them are quite clear to decrease the cost, um, uh, have a continuous process improvement, uh, have time saving, but also get the customer satisfaction um, also behind. Um, um, but uh, well, the idea is, of course, um, to have our product uh, uh, available also for uh, other different product of FIFA, but uh, for uh, different also industries uh, for predictive maintenance in the next months. Um, as uh, the, in Europe, the manufacturing industry represents more than uh, 2.5 million uh, companies. So. Um, so through through the, the AI for EU uh, challenge, uh, so we we had the possibility to develop our 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 platform and and also uh, to scale uh, in the next months. Uh, about this, so just few words about the support program. So it was it was it was great because. Um, we, it helps us to invest in our product development and uh, also um, uh, in people by recruiting. Yeah? Uh, we had great interaction uh, uh, with different teams. Um, we had great uh, mentoring session too. And so finally, uh, interaction with other company was uh, interesting and challenging uh, to uh, and ex um, get some exchange point of view also. Uh, you can join us, of course, uh, if necessary, uh, on our social network. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Very, very exciting, Valerie. Uh, the next speaker is Milad Bodros. Uh, Milad, please. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Milad Bodros, um, and I'm a senior NLP data scientist at uh, H Farm Innovation. Um, um, especially in the business unit located in Turin, specialized in artificial intelligence. Uh, there's a little bit of lag, maybe in the slides. Here we go. <laughs> Let's leave it. You can set up the slideshow to be on the one page. How do you do that? Set slideshow, slideshow to be on the second one. Okay. Yeah, browse on and you need to be the now present. Okay. Now, now it looks like working. Looks good now. Okay. Perfect. Now it looks like we overcome this technical problem. Um, as I was saying, my name is Milad Botros, and I'm a senior NLP data scientist at H Farm Innovation, um, especially in the business unit uh, specialized in AI based in Turin. Um, which works mainly with uh, providing businesses and organizations with AI solutions to address their business needs um, with a special interest in natural language processing. Nowadays, more and more people 
are aware and they do care about their own presence online and the, and the data they share with, with organizations or with companies or with providers. And as a result, those companies uh, have to meet this need, um, not only because they are obliged by uh, regulations such as the GDPR or uh, the Data Act, uh, but also because of this need of their customers. In fact, according to the Cisco Customer Privacy Survey in 2019, 84% uh, of the people who answered the survey said that they cared not only about their own data and their own privacy, but also about other people's privacy. And they wanted more control. 80% said that their not only do they care, but they're actually willing to take an action and they expect to spend more time and money to protect their own data. And around half of the respondents to that survey said that they've, in the past, they've actually acted upon that and they've maybe changed uh, a company or they switched providers just because of their data policies. So it's, people do care about it. And that's why um, uh, in the project of AI for EU, we chose to address the challenge, effective management of personally identifiable information, PII, for the agri-food data. Uh, and to address this, this challenge, we uh, propose our solution, which is Agronimai for managing PII in agri-food data, which is based on our solution an anonymization system called Anonymai. And to understand that, we need to understand what is Anonymai. Um, let's imagine these three scenarios, and these are three real life scenarios that we've worked with, and these are three possible clients or past clients. Let's imagine a um, research center, a medical research center, doing some research on a certain disease with certain uh, patients. And at, at, a, at a certain point, they would like to share these results or this data with another research center or university to expand and enhance on their research. These data contain personal information of their patients. And at some point, they would need to anonymize this data. Imagine a call center recording uh, their calls with their customers or any company that has a call center. Uh, and during the calls, the, the customers, in order to identify them, themselves, for example, they give out personal information. They would like to share this data with a training team, for example, uh, and at some point they would need to anonymize the data. A third and a last example, imagine a publishing house specialized in, legal, uh, in the legal domain, where they collect all the court cases and the court sentences from all over the country, and they publish it online for lawyers in order to use it as a resources for uh, preparing for their own cases. These court cases contain personal information of a lot of people, and at some point they need to be uh, anonymized. And this is why Anonymi. Unlike other solutions out there, which focus on structured data or tabular data, that in the form of table, which known given the name of the column, you know what to expect. For example, in the column, so if the column called first name, you know that where, where are the names in this document and where are the ages and where are the salaries and so on. Unlike that, our solution mainly focuses on unstructured data or data in the form of free text, um, which is able to identify the spans of text that contain personal information and classify them giving them the correct label in order for them later to hide them or to anonymize them. So what kind of personal information can Anonymi detect? Anonymi can detect a very wide range of personal information, ranging from direct identifiers, such as name, surname, and email address, all the way to indirect identifiers, as, long as, as well as natural identifiers and special categories, such as sexual orientation and health-related problems. So in a nutshell, Anonymi is an anonymization service that helps organizations to protect their own data and the data of their own clients. And it currently fully supports two languages, English and Italian, 
Um, it supports other languages, but we've tested English and Italian thoroughly, so we can say safely that it supports English and Italian. Um, let's have a look at the tool itself. So this is a live demo. Uh, we're here on the left if you can put in some text, for example, a short sentence. Uh, you choose to anonymize. We can see here on the right that it anonymized. It, it was able to detect name and surname, even though my name and surname are not very common, but it was able to detect them as names and surnames, age, uh, my profession, where I work, and so on. So it does work. The next question would be, how does it work? Under the hood, Anonymai uses, it, 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 it's made up of three components. The first one, a pre-processing component where it receives the document and then it does some pre-processing. It passes the outcome to the second component, uh, the entity recognition one, where it applies a series of machine learning and deep learning and rule-based systems. And at the end, an anonymization module where you can anonymize the, the information. Um, Anonymai comes with a set of configurable rules where you can, or a set of profiles where you can uh, customize. Um, and the reason for that is that ideally you would need, you could, you could anonymize everything in the document, but that might render the document not very useful for the business. So what you would need is to find this sweet spot, the green one, which it says possible trade-off, where you can guarantee Maximum, we can guarantee privacy without losing the utility of the document. Um, here you could also, here is a screenshot of how you could configure the rules. Here, for example, you could say, um, if, for example, in your document it says something like the pharmacist in Bologna, um, there are many pharmacists in Bologna, so you could not identify the person, but if it said, for example, the pharmacist of Montenegro, which is small municipality next to Turin, where I come from. Uh, there's only one pharmacy, so if I say the pharmacist of, uh, of Montenegro, you would be able to identify the pharmacist. So you could create a rule saying that if in the document, if there is the occupation and the city are present, you could anonymize only the city. Uh, so you'd hide the identity of, uh, of the data subject. One last thing, um, as maybe you've seen in the demo, there are these numbers. Uh, name one and surname one and so on. Uh, and this is also to prevent unnecessary loss of information. So for example, if we look at this example here, it says uh, from the first sentence, we know that someone bought a car from someone and someone was happy. Um, we don't know who is happy. Was it the buyer or the seller? If we look at the original sentence, we know uh, that was is, it was the seller. So in order not to lose this piece of information during the anonymization, we apply what is called a score reference resolution by adding a unique uh, identifier to each, to each entity. There are so many possible uh, ways to, to enhance that and better our solution in the future. Um, for example, working on including more and more patterns, uh, such as international phone numbers, not only numbers from English and Italian domain, uh, other improvements would be to work on differentiation of uh, label level. So, for example, we recognize names, but what if what if I want to recognize only the names of the judges and not the lawyers, for example? Uh, another improvement was to work with the different formats, PDFs, Word, and PowerPoints. And one last one is to work directly with images um, uh, and videos. This is the team of Anonymai. Um, a group of people with uh, a wide range uh, of skills. This is the, the group of Anonymai, and this is the team of Anonymai, anonymized with Anonymai. <laughs> Thank you very much, and we'd be more than happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Milan. Uh, many, many thanks for the presentation. And last but not least, we have Svetla Bojceva. And, and, and Svetla, please, uh, the floor is yours. Hello, my name is Svetla Bojceva from Sirma AI Trading as Ontotex. It's my pleasure to present our solution 
uh, for AI for AU code classify oncology diseases Espanol. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, what uh, who we are? We are a semantic uh, technology leader. We're uh, providing technologies uh, for integration of uh, unstructured and structured data into knowledge graphs. Uh, and uh, our core product is uh, GraphDB, which is uh, RDF triple store. We're providing uh, solutions for different uh, sectors. Here you can see a, a wide range of sectors. Uh, particularly for uh, this uh, solution, we're providing solution for healthcare domain, addressing the challenge uh, identification of colon cancer risk factors. Uh, we were happy to uh, receive a support training and mentoring uh, uh, from AI for EU support program. Um, we received also financial support and business mentoring for further financing and exploration. Uh, also, uh, we were happy uh, to, to work with uh, uh, really um, mature ecosystem of uh, other solution providers and uh, um, uh, organizations, uh, we uh, uh, developed our uh, services and uh, used the AI for AU uh, marketplace uh, to deploy them uh, for uh, further exploitation. Okay. Uh, the objective uh, of our solution is to develop a natural language processing uh, tool that automatically predicts the uh, codes uh, from international classification of diseases and provision from free text uh, data in Spanish. Uh, this uh, um, uh, classification is widely used um, uh, international classification, uh, which uh, has uh, translations for the majority of European languages. And uh, this is a really rich uh, uh, statistical classifications with um, uh, more than 12,000 uh, classes. And uh, the clinical modification uh, contains 95,000 classes, really comprehensive version of the classification. Uh, you can see here a short piece of uh, text uh, uh, from discharge letter in Spanish. Also, uh, here is presented the anatomy of uh, uh, the ICD-10 codes, which uh, contains the category and more specifically, uh, extensions for etiology, location, laterality, and extension. And uh, this classification has a hierarchical structure. Uh, currently, uh, such annotation with ICD-10 classes uh, was done manually by uh, healthcare professionals. And uh, this is really efforts and uh, time consuming uh, and um, uh, healthcare professionals uh, spent a lot of time for coding uh, um, uh, unstructured uh, clinical text uh, to uh, different uh, classifications uh, like ICD-10. This is really important uh, for um, uh, healthcare administration, for reimbursement, uh, and also for uh, health insurance companies, uh, and as well as uh, for researchers, other stakeholders, which I will mention at the end of the presentation. Uh, our solution is based on deep learning transformers. Uh, it uh, follows uh, the three uh, basic steps. Uh, our main uh, blocks uh, are based on uh, uh, birth family models. These are uh, deep learning transformers uh, uh, which are trained on uh, common vocabulary. Beto is trained for common vocabulary in Spanish, but is uh, not trained uh, for uh, medical terminology. Clinical birth is uh, trained uh, for clinical terminology, but in English. Multilingual birth for common vocabulary on w more than 100 uh, languages, but uh, no knowledge uh, related to medical domain and sub-birth is again for English language model. We uh, um, collected a huge corpora of uh, Spanish medical texts and we pre-trained and fine-tuned all these birth uh, models uh, for Spanish medical terminology. 
uh, this is the adaptation uh, stage, which we uh, use to adapt the uh, basic models uh, to deal with uh, the domain-specific terminology. And then we customized uh, our solutions uh, to be able to predict the codes for uh, ICD-10 um, classification uh, based uh, on uh, the uh, Spanish version for uh, this uh, classification. Uh, our uh, models uh, were trained on public data only using linked open data like Wikidata and BioPortal using uh, Sparkle Curies uh, to uh, collect data. Uh, also uh, labels from standard classification and ontologies here are mentioned. Uh, most uh, of the uh, widely used uh, standard classification and ontologies like SNOMED, MESH, Mondo, Uni uh, fight medical language system, etc. Also, we used public data like Wikipedia, uh, benchmark data set, uh, which is annotated, CODI ESP. Uh, also, we uh, collected uh, open access scientific medical publications in Spanish, uh, web based medical dictionaries in Spanish. Also, we used uh, a lot of publications available in PubMed and uh, PubMed Central. Um, the developed services are beyond the current state-of-the-art technologies. Uh, uh, we measured uh, our uh, performance uh, using the benchmark data set called the ESP, and uh, this uh, is a uh, data set with a little bit wider range of uh, diseases. It covers more than 2,500 uh, uh, ICD-10 codes, uh, and uh, for the final solution, uh, we addressed uh, uh, the use case for colorectal cancer and uh, developed a service uh, especially for uh, this use case uh, covering 158 uh, ICD-10 categories uh, related to colorectal cancer yeah. use case and associated uh, diseases. And we developed uh, as well a generic code service uh, which covers uh, 4,000 ICD-10 uh, codes for wider range of diagnosis. Uh, the use of our application is um, uh, really uh, uh, wide because uh, this is a core component uh, which is necessary for healthcare professionals as an assistant tool for clinical documentation creation, also for health insurance, for research to identify risk factors and diagnostic associations, for integration of heterogeneous data that will all study of more in-depth insights into medicine. And uh, our ambition is uh, these uh, specific services uh, to be extended also for other diseases and uh, to cover multilinguality because our models are trained uh, for uh, more rich uh, uh, language models which allow uh, even uh, in this uh, version to be used uh, not only for Spanish but also for, uh, for other European languages. And uh, here is a small uh, demo, which, uh, which could, could you please show it? Yeah, uh, this uh, is a basic user interface because our service is a backend service. It uh, actually uh, doesn't supposed to have an interface where you can uh, use this uh, for single diagnosis uh, to predict uh, the ICD-10 codes. Uh, this is uh, for colorectal uh, cancer and uh, uh, the next presentation is uh, for a little bit uh, uh, wide, uh, bigger chunk uh, piece of uh, uh, clinical text usually the clinical text which we're processing is uh, several pages and uh, could you please uh, uh, run this example uh, this uh, one actually covers uh, uh, several diseases and uh, the predicted codes uh, here cover E11, for instance, is for diabetes mellitus. Uh, also here the patient is, uh, has pains, uh, fever, for meeting, and etc., which covers uh, the wide range of diagnosis uh, for this patient. 
This is uh, our core team uh, on the top and um, additional people from company who contributed uh, partially to the project. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Svetla. Thank you very much. And thanks to all the presenters for uh, your presentations. I thought they were excellent. And despite of the technical difficulties that we had in there, I would say to the audience, please do not hesitate to get in touch with the entrepreneurs and the people that were just speaking to you. I think they they were uh, using uh, the platform, I think, in a wide breadth uh, of different type of services, ranging from industry and agriculture to air quality, and then obviously all the way to the end where you had health issues. I might say as a joke that having too much of wine might lead to the, the last case yeah. where, <laughs> where we ended up. But in, in this case, many thanks for the presentations. And now we have a little bit of time for the, uh, the discussion. And, and please uh, shoot your questions to directly to the people. Thank you. Now it's a good opportunity to ask even the most difficult questions. So please do not hesitate. Ilka, we have a question in the chat, if you want to read it, or I can okay. read it for you, yeah? Uh, yeah, I, I, I see it. I'll, I'll okay, read. I can read. Could the yeah. presenter of the pilot let us know resources they have used and existed catalog and resources and experiment they have uploaded in the ai for eu platform? Okay, who wants to answer? Milad? Okay, the floor is yours. Is it is it a general question to all or to a specific pilot? Okay. I, yeah, I think it would it would be different from um, from one pilot and one from one project to another. Um, in this project, um, in our challenge, the, the the data set was provided by the challenge owner, so it was. Um, uh, um, a repository of data sets collected in the field of research for agri-food containing personal information about farmers uh, uh, and the people who are working in that domain. Um, we of course enriched that with other uh, publicly available data um, in order to train the models um, as long as uh, gazetteers such as uh, geo names um, and so on um, right now the the solution is uploaded to the ai for you platform um, and anyone i think uh, can access it um, our solutions uh, we actually provided uh, several versions of the services not only one solution we provided several solutions are uploaded uh, at uh, ai for au marketplace you can find them also uh, they have uh, parameters to switch between models they can be multiplied they are not only two they are actually four <laughs> and uh, also counting the benchmark, there are six <laughs> solutions, and they uh, are uh, uh, solely based on public data, and uh, we didn't use the data from the uh, marketplace uh, because we uh, collected uh, a, a huge amount of uh, public data which was necessary for our models. If some one of the online speakers want uh, to add something, please. Yes, I can. Please go. Ahead. <laughs> so uh, yes, we published our solutions also on the AI for EU platform. So uh, named uh, RP for PL. Uh, there is one for predictive failures and one for um, reliable, uh, useful lifetimes of um, RUL. Um, and so uh, yes, it, it's based on the on the on the data uh, coming from the challenge owner. So Pfeiffer explained it before. So voila. Thank you so much, Valerie. And Peter, do you want to add something? Yes, our solution is onboarded on the AI for You platform and on the AI for you experiments platform. So you can download a solution package to deploy it into Kubernetes. The whole pilot and run it yourself if you want. 
Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes, please. Yeah, no, in our case, it's uh, similar. So we have uh, already uploaded some resources to the to the catalog, but also to the to the A4U experiment. So uh, we, we use a particular tag, uh, AI for Agri. So you can find uh, directly the the uh, artifacts and everything that if you look for this tag. Also. OK, thank you very much. I want uh, really to thank Ilka for sharing this session and all the speakers because the presentation were really interesting and amazing.